Hey, it's Jeremy from OpticHouse.com. So I am looking at this video, and these are the layouts for the cover to issue 5 of Morningstar. And this was one I posted a video of me doing the thumbnails not too long ago. And it's interesting to come back and look at this now and see the things that I'm still struggling with. I mean, there are a lot of things in this cover, mostly the horse anatomy, that I felt like it's always good to challenge yourself, to push yourself, because it makes you realize, it keeps you humble, makes you realize how much further you have to go, and it's a long way to go. And it is good sometimes to struggle with something. Because I will tell you that I have been thinking a lot about this recently. Um, the art book that I'm using for reference there is The Art of Animal Drawing by Ken Holtgren. And along with uh, the Jack Ham How to Draw Animals book, this one has, is... It's a book that I've had for a long time, but the Jack Ham book is the one that had been my predominant go-to book for a long time. But I had actually asked my figure drawing instructor, Carl Ganas, for some recommendations on good animal books, and he had recommended the Holtgren book. And I was like, wow. Uh, again, this goes back to reference rot. It's a book that I've had for years and only cracked open a few times. So I went back to it, and I've been cracking it open and, and drawing from it some more. And I was specifically using this more for reference uh, for the cover. And part of the reason why I wanted to get back into doing more studies from animals, why I was asking for animal drawing reference books, is because something kind of hit me not too long ago. And I may have mentioned this in another video, and if not, you know, if I have, never hurts to hear it again. Um, but I was thinking about how, well, I was making a list of things that I need to get better at. I need to get better at animal drawing, I need to get better at perspective, composition, anatomy, all these other things. Animals were on the list. And I had started doing some studies from the, uh, the Jack Ham book, and I sort of saw all at once, like it hit me like a bolt of lightning when I was in figure drawing class, actually, and I was thinking about some of the stuff I was struggling with with the animal drawings. And it's that the, the strength and the energy and the, the drama that we're trying to capture in figure drawings, because you can have a model in a very relaxed reclining pose, you can have a model, you know, holding a, a broomstick like it's a sword or actually holding actual props, doing something like yelling or in a pose of screaming, all kinds of physical actions, they can be acting. But humans are, they're acting when they do this. Animals aren't acting. Animals are being. Animals are in the moment. They're just existing. They're living. They're thriving. And because of that, there's a purity to their gestures. There's a purity of it, a purity of energy, a purity of, of what they're, they're communicating in that. And it made me realize, well, you know, artists that I see that do beautiful animal work, um, the, the, at the very top of my mind is Claire Wendling, you know, because all of her animals are just beautiful and stunning. Um, artists that are really good at drawing animals, from what I have seen, in my, my opinion, tend to draw really strong figures as well. Because that same poetry that they put into the animal's body, they put it into humans' bodies. And I realized that much as I'm struggling to make my human figures more poetic, if I really engage in animals and really go into a deep dive of studying their gesture and, you know, studying animal anatomy from books and then actually going to, to zoos or parks or equestrian centers to draw from life and study and try to capture that, making my animal drawing stronger will make my human figure drawing stronger. And I almost feel like, even though I want to learn how to draw all animals well, the horse is an animal that's a really easy one to study because, you know, in a lot of major cities, um, there's equestrian centers where you can go and just study. And, you know, where I am in Southern California, there's a few that aren't hard for me to get to. So I can actually make it a point to go on a semi-regular basis. I need to start developing that habit of going in, in, out and drawing horses from life as well as anything else. You know, and, and start building that strength, that energy. What's also interesting in, in looking at this is, 
seeing like these rear legs that I'm looking at, and you see me drawing and erasing, drawing and erasing. I struggled with these legs. I struggled with them. Just even though there's books that you can look at any good animal book will have a horse, the different leg positions for a trot, a run, a canter, what have you. I still, yeah, I was trying to do a, a horse and kind of a trot, and the leg is probably higher than it should be for a trot, the front leg. But I just struggled with a pose that felt exactly like what I wanted. It had some drama to it, but it was still kind of casual. I very much wanted to, to get this, this casual feel of, of Gabrielle just strolling in, cool as death. And I mentioned that because when I originally started doing this piece, it's very different from my original inspiration, which was I was trying to do an homage to Frazetta's Death Dealer. But I pushed in. I kept making the composition tighter and tighter. Somewhere I've got a, another layout that I got pretty far with. Like I think I finished all of the red pencil and started drawing the, the, the back of the normal graphite before I got to the point where I realized it just didn't capture what I wanted. The original pose which was a much wider shot. And this one, just going in tighter, gets you, you can see more of her face and more of the horse expression. And I felt like that conveyed more of the drama of the storytelling I wanted. I didn't want her to feel as distant. But like many artists, I still second guess myself. I still think, even now watching this, and at this point that I'm talking, I've already drawn the actual cover. And you will get to see that video eventually as well. But even in doing this piece and being done with the finished pencils for the cover, I haven't colored it yet, but finishing the pencils, I still think, hmm, maybe that long shot might still be the way to go. Um, I may go back and do a pose very similar to this, but in a wider shot as an experiment, just to see what happens. Because I think that's also important, is to try taking different versions of a piece to completion to see what it looks like. Um, I remember hearing somewhere, it might have been in a podcast or in in a written interview that I read, but the uh, the illustrator and comic artist Eric Canetti, you know, talking about how a lot of times he'll do commissions for people, and he quote unquote wastes so much time because he'll do a piece all the way to completion, have it done, and be like, "Nope, this isn't it. This isn't good enough. I'm starting over." And <laughs> he said that um. You know, other artists he knew, or maybe it was his art rep, or somebody that was close to him, commented that he was, like, driving him crazy. Like, dude, it's a good piece. And he's like, yeah, but it's not right. There's a difference between being good at, you know, it's like you don't want to be good enough. And that's something that I, I think all artists struggle with, is wanting something to be not just good, but to be great. And it's hard to feel about any piece that you make that it's great because there's just something that's so arrogant about taking something that came out of your own hand and saying, oh, this is great. You know, I mean, people, barring people having kids aside, that's, you know, that's a different thing. But yeah, but when you're making art, you're so critical of it and wanting to make it better than it is. And you're always questioning how it can be better. That's part of the analytic process. That's how we grow is by constantly asking, how can this be better? Um, you know, even with uh, the rifle that I drew in there, I realized in this that I had just drawn a very generic, you know, a very generic rifle that I gave her. So I went back and um, I think I have a Western book that I was looking at. It was one of the DK books. And I looked up, what was it? It was a Winchester rifle. And I went in and I drew on top of it and added some more, you know, not a lot of redrawing, just a little bit of details on top in terms of like the wooden stock um, coming out a little bit further. Um, or the wooden part of the, the barrel, you know, changing the sights a little bit to make it look more like a Winchester rifle because that, you know, that rifle is what I was imagining when I originally did this. Adding a curve to the, the butt of the, the, the stock where it sits into her shoulder. You know, just little small details here and there. You know, and I also realize that I probably shouldn't have even drawn the sky in this piece. As I started to indicate it in there... I realized the sky I really want is going to be mostly Photoshop. I'm going to use some soft brushes and just sort of like, you know, airbrush in some clouds as opposed to having a pencil rendered sky. There's no reason for me to put lines in there. The reason why I did it is because I've been trying to make my pencil drawings feel more finished and not as loose, not as sketchy. And I felt like I needed to indicate some form of clouds in pencil there. 
That's not really true, at least not in this case. I mean, in this case, knowing that I'm going to be coloring the piece myself, it doesn't have to be in there. I probably would be better off leaving it completely empty, and I may go back and erase the, the clouds that I drew into the final pencil version. But I should also look at how other artists render clouds in pencil if I really want to have it be finished, feel finished in pencil. In this case, you know, Photoshop color, I think will work fine. We'll see how it turns out. You'll see. I'll see. That's it for now. Check out my website, OpticHouse.com. If you enjoy these videos, please share them. Also, sign up for my weekly newsletter to get a free digital download and see what else I'm working on. Go be creative.